Connecting the Dots with Dr. Wilmer Leon, where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge. Welcome to the Connecting the Dots podcast with Dr. Wilmer Leon. I'm Wilmer Leon. Here's the point. We have a tendency to view current events as though they occur in a vacuum, failing to understand the broader historical context in which most events take place. During each episode of this podcast, my guests and I will have probing, provocative, and in-depth discussions that connect the dots between current events and the broader historical context in which the events occur. This will enable you to better understand and analyze the events that are impacting the global village in which we live. On today's episode, the question before us is, why is the United States working to reinvade and colonize Haiti. My guest is a professor at the Institute for the Study of Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. She's a member of the Black Alliance for Peace and an editor of the Black Agenda Review segment of the Black Agenda Report. And she's the author of a very, very substantive piece, Haiti as Empire's Laboratory. Dr. Jamima Pierre. Dr. Pierre, welcome to the show, and let's connect some dots. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, you write in your piece that the Global Fragility Act presents new strategies for deploying U.S. hard and soft power in a changing world. It focuses U.S. foreign policy on the idea that there are so-called fragile states, countries prone to instability, extremism, conflict, and extreme poverty, which are presumably threats to U.S. security. Explain first, what is the Global Fragility Act and why should Americans, not to mention its victims, be so concerned about it? Yes, yeah, so the Global Fragilities Act was actually um, passed in, um, was actually uh, uh, presented in, in 2019, I think, under Donald Trump, and then was um, um, ratified under uh, um, uh, the Biden administration. And it really is a way to rebrand U.S. foreign policy. Um, and I don't know if you, your listeners know about the Monroe Doctrine, which the U.S. passed about 100 years ago, which basically said that the U.S. had access, um, that no one can encroach in U.S.'s influence in the Western Hemisphere. And through the Monroe Doctrine, the U.S. was able to assert its influence, um, occupy, invade nations whenever it deemed necessary, um, and got away with it for 100 years. And so the upheaval that we've seen um, throughout Latin America, the coup d'etats, the regime changes, the 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 support for um, support for um, military uh, dictatorships and so on and so forth has occurred through the Monroe Doctrine, but the Global Fragility Act was really um, brought by the conservative. Um, think tank, the U.S. Peace Institute, which is actually misnamed as far as I'm concerned. But it was really a, a, a way to look at U.S. foreign policy in, in a different light or to rebrand it. And what I mean by rebrand is, is that to basically come together to make it seem like the U.S. was not doing what it was doing and, was, and, and it was basically bringing together the work of the Department of Defense, the Department of the State, and the USAID. So linking together aid defense, as well as, um, you know, um, political, you know, State Department moves. And the idea was basically an opportunity to change the way that the U.S. did business by using local partners, um, by not necessarily doing the dirty work of putting boots on the ground if it needed to invade a place. But it was really trying to figure out how to actually change the internal politics of a place to really prevent adversary, and they say in, in the act, adversaries such as China and Russia from expanding their influence. In this way, they use civil society, um, they use military, and then they use diplom so-called diplomacy, um, bringing together. But what's key to this, they, always, they also use local um, regional partners such as um, you know, other states, other formations such as the Caribbean community and so on and so forth to actually uh, assert US, U.S. power. And so what's interesting about the Global Fragilities Act is that it was 
passed by Trump, but ratified under Biden and then was uh, implemented. And, and they at first they said they were gonna focus on a, a set of countries with which Haiti being the very first. Um, um, so what it is, is the, so it's Haiti first and then Libya, Mozambique, Papua New Guinea, along with uh, a, 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 they call the coastal countries of West Africa. What's fascinating about this, this order is that Haiti and Libya are the states Two of the states, you know, besides Iraq, <laughs> that are probably the most destroyed by the U.S. Um, and its allies, and so, and, and and it's going under this the guise that these people are, you know, that these states are so fragile, they're a mess, they're full of corruption, and so on and so forth, without really talking about the underlying problem, which is these states are fragile because of U.S. constant. Um, um, interventions and U.S. creating instability in in, in the state. So, um, so, so I'll stop there to just give a, to, as a short background. Well, you know, one of the things that popped in my mind when you said Haiti and then you said Libya, one of the common threads between the two are the Clintons, because if I remember my history correctly, it was then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton that convinced then President Obama, then President Barack Obama, to invade Libya and assassinate Muammar Gaddafi. And we know that Hillary Clinton, again, was very much involved in uh, in the destabilization, the, the most recent destabilization of Haiti. Oh, definitely. Well, the Clintons are, are they've got dirt all over them. Um, I mean, when it comes to Haiti, the Clintons, you know, I have a piece that I wrote a long time ago, about 11 years ago. You know, I say, you know, the Clintons are omnipotent, omnipresent. <laughs> They're everywhere. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, we have to think about what Clinton, Bill Clinton did with by killing um, Haiti's rice production facility, by dumping um, the rice of his Arkansas farmers into Haiti and destroying Haiti's rice economy. So we have to think about what he did when he was president. But they've been dealing with Haiti for a long time. And we have to think also about after the earthquake where Obama put Clinton and Georgia W. Bush in charge of Haiti aid and the people that benefited the most from, from the earthquake that killed 300,000 Haitians was the Clinton Foundation, which raised tons of money. And Haiti saw nothing except for uh, these fancy hotels that you know they're, they made, they're making profits off. So there's that. But what's most important is in 2011, during the Arabs, the so-called Arab, Arab Spring, um, Hillary Clinton flew to Haiti and changed the election results um, that actually put in power the current um, political, um, so-called political party that's there now, uh, Michelle Martelly, who actually was just named in the UN report as one of the biggest um, funders for gangs in Haiti, who's also the president, the former president, right? And so they, you know, they forced Haiti to have elections right after, eight months after an earthquake that debilist, that destabilized the whole country, where about a million people were still living um, in tents outside. But they forced these elections because this is how they could control Haiti. And when their favorite candidate, Martelly, did not make the first round, they decided that they were going to force that. So Hillary Clinton flew into Haiti and, and threatened the sitting president with exile if he did not allow the change uh, to the ballots to make this guy who did not make the first round president. And, and every, you know, everything has been bad since then. You mentioned Bill Clinton decimating the domestic Haitian rice production. In his book, The Choice, Sam Yet talks about the tie of rice to the start of the Vietnam War. And how many people don't don't discuss one of the major motivating factors for the United States to go into Indochina had to do with protecting American rice interests because they didn't want Asian rice flooding the market. And then that also made me think about NAFTA and what NAFTA did to the domestic corn production in Mexico, decimated the uh, the production of, of Mexican corn, which then... Uh, decimated the livelihoods for Mexican farmers, which has contributed to uh, immigration of Mexicans into the United States. So I, I again, the show is called Connecting the Dots. And so uh, any any thoughts on that? Well, definitely. I, I think, I don't remember where I saw that recently, that rice farmers, is it rice? 
rice producers were looking forward to having access back again to Haiti's market once this military inv invasion happened. And so, you know, there, there's a lot of things to think about. Under Reagan, um, Haiti, the Haitian government was forced to kill its local pigs, the black pigs. Um, I don't know if people have heard about this, but you can look up Haiti black pigs. Um, black pigs are um, indigenous to the to that region. Um, and the Haiti was told that the, the pigs had some disease and they had to basically call, kill the entire population of black pigs uh, on the island in order so that they, and then they were replaced by the white pigs from, from the south of the US. And, 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 and you know, pigs who are, uh, who are from the US do not, are not used to the climate in the Caribbean. And so then they required very specific kinds of feeding, you know, um, 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 uh, food to eat. And so those had to be imported. So that decimated um, the Haitian economy. So there's a way that you can see um, all these connected. The other thing is, I don't think people, people always ask, well, you're making a big deal about Haiti. Why is Haiti, Haiti's not that important. Why is, you know, why would the U.S. spend so much time and energy trying to destabilize Haiti? And then you realize, then you have to ask these people, well, why does the U.S. have the, why is the fourth largest U.S. embassy in the world in Haiti? If Haiti was not so important, why did the U.S. feel that they have to do it? And why, despite everything going on, like this week, despite the fact that you have the genocidal um, Zionist state killing um, thousands of Palestinians, they forced the UN to have a meeting about this intervention in Haiti over gangs, right? Supposedly over gangs. So that tells you there's something in there because Haiti actually becomes a big manufacturing hub for the US. And so I think, you know, a lot of us have been saying as the US, um, um, as the US moves towards a war with China, they will need a replacement of their manufacturing hubs. And Haiti already, you know, within the 11 million strong population, Haiti already provides uh, 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 it is a space for a large manufacturing hub already. So as they lose Asia, they're going to rely more on Haiti. Um, and so we have to think about that in terms of the economics of that, as well as the politics, which we, which we can get into um, later on as we speak more. You, you, you write uh, in, in your piece, uh, in April of 22, the Biden-Harris administration affirmed its commitment to the Global Fragilities Act by outlining a strategy for its implementation. As detailed in the strategy's prologue, the U.S. government's new foreign policy approach depends on, quote, willing partners to address common challenges and share costs. Ultimately, the document continues, no U.S. or international intervention will be successful without the buy-in and mutual ownership of trusted regional, national, and local partners. And you you touched on that uh, in your open, but I think it's very important for people to really understand that's really nice flower, flowerly language, but it's not innocuous. That is a very nice way of saying that the United States is going to use organizations indigenous organizations in order to promote American interests? Oh, oh, definitely. Not just indigenous organizations, uh, local states, you know, I mean, uh, you know, there's a, the recent invade, the, the upcoming invasion, military invasion of Haiti, supposedly over gangs, right, um, is actually being led supposedly by Kenya. And so all of a sudden you're asking yourself, Kenya is all the way across the world on the east side of the African continent. What does Kenya have to do with Haiti? Well, before Kenya, the U.S. tried to do um, tried to use CARICOM, which is a Caribbean, the a Caribbean community of, um, of uh, a community of uh, uh, Caribbean states and nations. And so that didn't work as well. Before then, they tried to get uh, um, uh, CELAC, which is the Central Latin, Central and Latin American communities, to lead in the invasion. Before then, they tried to get um, Brazil. Um, so before then, they tried to get Canada to lead the invasion. And before that, they tried to get Brazil to lead the invasion. The thing is to not have boots on the ground, as we've seen in the U.S. in, U in Ukraine, for example. The point is to use other so-called stakeholders, get other people to do the dirty work of U.S., um, of U.S. intervention and, and foreign policy in, 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 in to get buy-in. And the reason I say Haiti's a laboratory, this is not the first time this is happening. And in the piece I outlined, 
you know, the uh, the, the the Canada, France, and U.S. Um, push uh, U.S. Uh, back coup d'état that happened in Haiti in 2004, where the U.S. and and France, um, uh, who who are membership in the Security Council. Um, they were they were behind this coup d'état in 2004. Immediately after the U.S. Marines landed, took our our, our president, put him on a plane, and flew him to Africa. Um, you had French, Canadian, and U.S. soldiers there, but these two U.N. Security Council members were able to use their position to call an emergency U.N. Security Council meeting to push for a multinational so-called stabilization force in Haiti. So they, so to me, the UN is bankrupt with this Security Council in this particular sense, right? So these people were able to use that. And then they, they convinced the UN that Haiti needed a chapter seven deployment. And chapter seven deployment is only for countries that are at war with other, you know, there's a civil war. There was no civil war in Haiti. They managed to convince the UN. So then what they ended up doing by, was, uh, was, was sending getting a UN so-called peacekeeping mission to Haiti in a country that was not a civil war. But what it meant that, you know, was that you can have up to 50 to 60 nations participate in an occupation of Haiti. And that's what ended up happening. Brazil led that, that meeting. And you had uh, people from all over the world, police and military from all over the world, occupying Haiti on behalf of the U.S. under the guise of providing stability. That group stayed there from 2004 to 2017 when they drew down and brought back a smaller force. But so the, Haiti is still under U.N. occupation. And this is what um, this uh, amazing law scholar, and I'm forgetting her name, um, I think it's China Meaville, calls multilateralism as terror. Because the new, and this is what the Global Fragility is at, and that's why Haiti is always a, a laboratory, is because you use Haiti, they tried it on Haiti and it worked. In fact, the WikiLeaks paper said the minister uh, peacekeeping mission in Haiti was the cheapest, um, uh, was a, a, a foreign policy bonanza for the U.S. because it was so cheap because they can use the U.N. and then they can use all the local Latin American countries to do the dirty work. And so it's just really um, important to think about that and to think about how they're going to move forward from now on. And now the other thing to talk about aid is that they've already in, established the second phase of the Global Fragilities Act in the summer. And they're saying they're going to fund so-called, they're going to fund 260 so-called civil society NGOs on the ground in order to basically shape policy in Haiti as they leave for, for elections. So the plan is to actually take over the, the 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 political structure of Haiti using the guise of you know civil society and and Haitian solutions. So to that point, what this results in and what the Global Fragilities Act does is it takes the Department of State and it takes and it combines the Department of State and the Pentagon, and it's using as you said in your piece. The hard power is the Pentagon. The soft power is the Department of State. And under the pretext or pretense of bringing stability to the country, that enables the United States to go in with the military and engage in regime change and engage in uh, control uh, of, the, of the domestic space but leaving out the fact that the reason the country is unstable in the first place is because of American policy in the country. Oh, definitely. And, and that's one of the key things we have to remember is this 2004 coup d'etat um, is a coup d'etat where Canada, France, and the U.S. got together in Ottawa and in, in Canada in 2003 and decided they needed to get rid of our elected, you know, democratically elected president. And then they followed through um, with this coup d'etat. And then it was it was given a go ahead by the U.N. because they run the U.N. Security Council. Right. And the other states on the U.N. Permanent Council also need to be held accountable because they sat quietly and let the U.S. and France run this. Right. I mean, the same way they did with Libya, allowing a, 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 a no fly zone over Libya. And so and so Haiti has been under occupation since 2004. And so what at the beginning of the coup d'etat in 2004, Haiti had about 7,000 elected officials. As of today, Haiti has zero elected officials. 
the U.S. and the U.N. through the core group, which is a group of unelected non-Haitian officials from the European Union, the Organization of American States, um, uh, you know, that that meet that so-called, you know, core, you know, that meet on to do to make plans for Haiti. They're the ones that have been running Haiti since 2004. So if there's a problem in Haiti, if there hasn't been any elections where we have no regional elections, no local elections, no presidential elections, it's because they have allowed that. If there are guns in the country, because Haiti does not manufacture guns, is because, and the guns are coming from the US, it's because they control what comes in and out of Haiti. They know who it is. In fact, the UN put out a report just last week stating explicitly that the former president that Hillary Clinton installed actually was funding two major gangs in Haiti um, to go after his enemies and to wreak havoc in the neighborhoods. And so what tells me, all this tells me that everything that's happened in the last 19 years has been while Haiti's under occupation. And what they want to do is wreak havoc. And I don't know if people know this, like, you know, the U.S. has been trying to get an intervention force in Haiti for two years since the assassination of the, pre of the president. And I have to say, as an aside, the Was that Jovenel Moïse? The assassination? Jovenel Moïse, right. Okay. I have to put that in aside, that assassination happened about a month after Moïse came back from Russia, trying to establish relationships with Russia. And so I, and I have to, this is an important piece that I think matters, right? And that was the first time that Haiti was trying to establish uh, relations with Russia. And so, so, so part of that is because Haitians were protesting against intervention from the very beginning, they were always in the streets. And people forget that Haitians have been protesting against U.S. meddling for the longest time, from the night, from 2018, 19. In 2020, there were millions of Haitians on the street protesting to get rid of this puppet government that the U.S. had installed and so on. People were protesting over and over again, and the U.S. could not get this passed. And so then, I don't know if you realize it, and then so, so all of a sudden, this gang problem emerges and it seems out of hand because the ton, the, 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 the amount of guns entering the country the past two years has been unprecedented. And they're dumping guns and ammunition into the country. The guns are coming directly from Haiti. So they're fomenting this idea that there's this gun. Coming directly to Haiti. To Haiti through the right. ports that are owned by the elite, right? The ports that are owned by the elite that, you know, the, the Haitian oligarchy, that a couple of them have been named in the UN a, a, a report just last week uh, that they need to be sanctioned. The U.S. hasn't sanctioned any of them. They have not stopped, you know, they have not followed through the embargo that the Chinese government said that they should put. So they basically created, exacerbated the gang problem. That's what I should say. They exacerbated the gang problem. So then every news media you see about Haiti the past year has been about gangs, not about the fact that Haitians were protesting the fact that this illegitimate government signed this deal with the IMF to remove fuel subsidies and made life extremely expensive for Haiti, or the fact that the people were protesting this prime minister that was installed by the U.S. in the core group. And so we forget that people were protesting against U.S. empire, protesting against a, a, a de facto government that they didn't elect, and now we're only focusing on gangs. And it's easy to do that because they can manufacture that consent because they control everything that's going on in Haiti. So then they create the basket case, and then they come in and they say, well, we're, we have to fix this problem because they need help, you know. What is the average daily income for a Haitian? Oh, I, I, you know, I haven't checked that in a while, but it's under three U.S. I think it's it's under five U.S. dollars per day. Okay, okay, yeah. five dollars a day. Under. Well, let's just for simple math, five dollars a day, seven days a week, thirty-five dollars a week. Okay. A Beretta forty caliber handgun costs about. $600. A Heckler and Koch 40 caliber handgun. It's about $800. An AR-15 style rifle is about $1,200. How does a person making $35 a week, and that's on the high side, afford a $600 handgun? A $1,200 Assault rifle, assault style rifle, unless they're being supplemented, <laughs> supplemented in quotes, by some external force. I, I so I, I wanted people, I wanted to make that point so that people could understand when you say that uh, 
they're being imported by the elite that you're you're not just you're not just spewing uh you know uh just random foolishness there's a logic to this and talk about the gangs because we've been hearing about the gang problem but it's not just simply not all gangs are gangs how, let me let me how about that Yes, definitely. Well, in addition to the guns, you have to think about ammunition because you can have a gun if you don't have an am- if you don't have ammunition. You know what can you do with it? You know, throw it, and, and- throw it at somebody. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so I have to say, you know, so in the past like three years, a number of high-powered military-grade um, uh, 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 guns in the country has gone up to almost a million. And so you're trying to figure out these. And then when you see the pictures, right? Um, you see pictures of young men in flip-flops and mismatched out, you know, shorts and raggedy shirts. Raggedy t-shirts and shorts. Raggedy t-shirts used, you know, the where they dump, you know, used US used clothes in Haiti. That's what they're wearing. That are many so we, many are many many of many of, a lot of that clothing is made in Haiti. <laughs> right. <laughs> Am I right? Exactly. And then sent back as charity, right? After people stop wearing them, right? And so, but yeah, and so you you have to ask yourself and you're like, um well, is this really, what? what is this problem? It's not like militaries are fighting against people. It's not like there's a civil war in Haiti. It's like these young men who are being paid um, to wreak havoc. And, and because the unemployment is so high in Haiti, it's really easy to find some young men and give, give them some guns and make them think, that they're doing something or, you know, you send them ammunition. And, you know, just recently um, the Haitian police stopped a van that was full of ammunition coming from the Dominican border into Haiti. Right. So, so we have to think about that. And, and this is the, the other part is, you know, Haiti has had a problem with paramilitary since the coup d'etat, since the U S occupied Haiti in, two, in 1915, changed our constitution and set up the Haitian police when they left 19 years later, which became like, uh, you know, the bane of our existence. And then, but also led to the, you know, the, the coming to power of Papa Doc and his, um, really horrible military force, um, paramilitary force, the Tonto Makut. So we've had this long history of U.S. sponsored um, terror through police. And then what, what ends up happening is with the end of the Aristide uh, government through a coup d'etat, you have a lot of former police, former military, because Aristide disbanded the military because he said the military was always the bane of Haiti's existence. So he disbanded the military. And a lot of them actually became part of these paramilitary troops that would come back and 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 you know be paid by the CIA um to 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 try and overthrow him. And so what you talk about gangs is you know this ragtag, you know, the news media likes to show these pictures of burning tires, ragtag guys holding AK-47, whatever they're holding, as if Haiti is like engulfed, right? And the reality is a lot of this is in the in the capital city with these groups, some of them are right near the U.S. embassy, so they know who they are, right? And so, but the other thing is you have the, the police, you know, the former police who also have, you know, form um, what we call paramilitary groups. You have the local elite who fund, um, who, who, who fund, uh, who fund uh, uh, armed groups to do what they needed to do. So you have a combination of things. But to me, you know, there's also a racialized path part of this, right? Because it's easy to say, well, Haiti's filled with gangs and these black people, look at them, look at the pictures, right? But look at this. There was a, there's a mass shooting in Maine with this guy holding a gun. They still can't find him. Many mass shootings in the U.S. are with white guys holding guns, but you don't see the breathless report. Imagine if we report about U.S. mass shooting the way they report about hate, you know. the 537 mass shootings in the United States since the 1st of January, 2023. And that's un- right. So and we only have 360 days, 365 days in the year. Right. So so and um, the, the reality is in, in places like Jamaica, they've been under state of emergency because of, of, of gang violence. And so why is Haiti um, thing? And you have to think there's some Something else going on. It can't be just about the gangs. And the other thing is the biggest gangsters in Haiti, as I always say, is the U.S., the core group and the U.N. the UN uh, mission there. Because how gangster can you get? You can meet in a different country. France, Canada and the U.S., they meet and they decide they're going to remove an elected president. That Or how gangster can you get 
can you get any more gangster than Hillary Clinton flying in and changing the election results of a supposedly sovereign country? So we have to redefine how we're thinking about this gang thing and really think about, well, who's funding these young men and who are the real gangsters of the world that can allow this to happen or that make this happen and then turn around and present themselves just because they're wearing suits, they present themselves as, 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 as the, real, the real people that can bring solutions. The, the, the name of this podcast is Connecting the Dots. Who did the United States follow into Vietnam? France. Who is the United States following in Niger? France. Who is the United States following into Haiti? France. Should we be connecting these dots, Dr. Pierre? Are, they, are these relevant dots to connect? I think on some level, I think, you know, um, you know, for West Africa, it's very interesting in terms of seeing the fall of French influence and empire. And I think the U.S. is coming in to clean up, to make sure that West Africa doesn't fall in the hands of, you know, supposed Russia. Right. And so as France wanes, they, they, they're jumping in to do that. And I think with Haiti, it was the same thing. It was like the U.S. came in, especially in the early 1900s. And, um, and, and through its Monroe Doctrine was basically to get rid of the, the, the European presence. And because, you know, there were a group of Germans that actually that were trying to that had, you know, that owned a lot of stuff in Haiti that were that were doing business in Haiti. And the U.S. did not want to have any um, uh, anyone outside of themselves to control the political and economic uh, situation in, in, in the, the region. And so that's exactly what's happening. The U.S. took over from France way early in right. the early 1900s. And so and, and it's been it's been doing that. And then France then just turns around and becomes a junior partner. Right. And, and continues the work of, 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 of the white West elite. Well, and not to get too deep into the weeds, but wasn't the basic premise of the Monroe Doctrine, it was an agreement between the United States and Europe. The United States committed to staying out of the affairs of Europe if Europe agreed to stay out of the affairs of the Americas, leaving the Americas to the United States. Exactly, exactly. Okay. All, except that now with the Global Fragilities Act, US, the, the U.S. is viewing Europe as, as junior partners as it you know um, in, intensifies its, its its control of the region, who went in? Who was the face of U.S. policy going in to Haiti and ushering out Jean Bertrand Aristide? Was it Colin Powell? Was he the was he the face? Was he the the story that I understand is he was the messenger that went in to Haiti. And told President Aristide, uh, you got to go. There's a plane on the tarmac. If you don't get on it. No, it, 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 yeah, it wasn't Colin Powell. It was um, the U.S. ambassador to Haiti. Um, I forgot his name um, at the time that actually the Marines had. But it was Colin Powell that was, you know, in, with Georgia R. Bush threatening, you know, and okay. if you go back to the media, you'll see, you know, there, there it's always a black face, right? I mean, there's always well, a black face to do to do that 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 work, right? That's the point I want, that's the dot I want to connect because it's now Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin that went to Kenya with the bag of cash to establish what a five year defense agreement with with Kenya in order to entice them. So Another black face on American imperialism. I I'm, I call that uh, minstrel diplomacy. Your your <laughs> thoughts? Definitely, and that's the most disappointing part. Is that this has been going on? You know the the bet. You know. It oh ha- wait a minute! Oh wait a minute! Way. Wait a minute! Wait a minute! And and it was when we want to talk about the uh, Caricom and the Global Fragilities Act. It it was um, not not Gregory Meeks. It was um, the, the 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 minority leader in the House from New York, Hakeem uh, Jeffries. Hakeem Jeffries, and it was it was Hakeem Jeffries. It was Vice President Kamala, Kamala Harris, Harris that went to Caricom. And when you mentioned uh, uh, Global Fragilities Act, I think that was co-sponsored by Karen Bass. Karen Bass and I, I forgot the the name of the other the other person. Yes, it was it was two black 
um, black two, faces on two black faces American on Empire. Empire. Right. And Empire. if we go to the UN, Linda Thomas Greenfield. And the State Department representative for the region is Brian Nichols. And um, he's so, and this is the most disturbing part to me is, you know, because it wasn't always this way. So for example, Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist Frederick Douglass, was sent to Haiti as a U.S. representative mm -hmm. um, in the late 1800s. Was it the ambassador? Yes, um, to, to send to Haiti. And, and they really went, they sent him to actually negotiate to get this Molson, this bay, Molson Nicola, which they still want actually to, to, to basically set up a base there, a U.S. military base there. The Haitians have always gone against that, which is why they ended up setting up the base in Guantanamo Bay. So if you look at the map, it's a you know, perfect way place, you know, for it's between Cuba and Haiti and this bay is there. And so it's perfect for the U.S. ships to go through, get through the Panama Canal or wherever they need to get through to get to the Pacific. Right. And so Frederick Douglass um, came back and advocated against against that on behalf of Haitians. He felt a responsibility, you know, and you also have um, the, the, the NAACP. Um, uh, I've uh, wrote writing on behalf of Haiti during the occupation from 19, 19, 1915 to 1934, um, saying that this is, you know, um, talking about how Citibank was behind the occupation and how, how badly the U.S. was treating Haitians and so on and so forth. It wasn't that, it wasn't always this way. Now you have, <clears throat> you know, Colin Powell, Condoleezza Rice, and then you have um, Barack Obama, because it was under Barack Obama that this latest um, um, uh, political party was put in power. This neo devalierist political party was put into power, and so you do have you you have this, and then you have them sending, you know, Brian Nichols, who's trying to get you know who's behind this pushing this intervention. So meeting with all of these um, people, getting the Caribbean, getting these these I call neo you know, neo-colonial coons, whatever you want to call them, the, you know, the head of Jamaica, the head of Barbados, the head of, Bar you know, Neil Motley, right? Who every, who's the, the UN's darling, because apparently the word on the street is that she's up for the UN Security Council Secretary General job. And so she's doing whatever needs to be done to get there. So the US has managed to get all these black people, now Kenya, who knows nothing about Haiti, get this, Kenya did not even have diplomatic relations to Haiti until last, with Haiti until last month, right before the UN vote. So Kenya knows nothing about Haiti. They are talking about training their police to speak French when the majority of Haitian people don't speak French, they speak Creole, right? And so part of that is to think about how easy it is to use black people, to use black faces to do empire's bidding. And I actually think, you know, China and Russia had been pushing against this intervention for the past two years. And I think, this last time, after two years of pushing back, they abstained. And I think part of the reason they abstained is because you had all these Black countries pressuring them. And I think one of the things is, I also think they're looking out for themselves and their relationship with these countries in Africa and the Caribbean. So they stepped back and allowed this intervention to go forward. But I think they stepped back because it was they're the onslaught of, 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 of pressure from the Black countries. Them. But why why abstain? Why not vote no? And right, and, because, and kill the, and kill the deal. Right, because they have that's what I'm saying. I think they're looking out for their own best interests. I think they don't want to ruin their relationships with these black countries who are pushing. I think, you know, I think that's part of that, right? And so I think okay. I think part of so they voted no all along and this time. So if you have Nia Motley, you have um Ruto. Not um, you have all these people saying this is Pan Africanism. We're going to go help our brothers and sisters in Haiti by sending a military intervention. That's what Ruto's using. They're using the language of Pan Africanism. Caricom is using the language of helping our brothers and sisters, even though Caricom has some of the most draconian anti-Haiti immigration policies, deportation rules, right? And but they're all using this language, and I do think that actually applied the pressure that the U.S. got them to apply on China, Russia actually worked to get them to abstain. At least they didn't vote yes, but the abstention, I think, is a result of the pressure. You mentioned the training of Haitian police through these Kenyan uh, interlocutors or these Kenyan invaders, but and 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 these Kenyan forces have been labeled as Kenyan police, but from what I've read, they're not Kenyan police. 
they're Kenyan paramilitary forces that have a reputation of being incredibly, incredibly brutal against their own countrymen. Yeah, definitely. And you know what's fat, what's most distressing about this situation um, is, is that the only solution that these people think that they can have for Haiti and Haitians is a is a violent military one, is the one that has to do with force. They never tried, you know, um, getting getting. They never tried, you know, diplomacy. They never tried actually sanctioning these elites that they know run guns into the country. And so, so yeah, so the thousand police is not police, it's paramilitary force, but also Kenya has a terrible reputation in Somalia, you know, in, in the proxy war there, right? Um, uh, going in there and, 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 and devastating, um, um, you know, uh, S- Somalis, right? And so for me, you know, just because they're black, in fact, if anything, I think, these police officers will treat Haitians worse because they're black um, in a way that they wouldn't. Can you imagine sending a Kenyan police force to Europe, uh, you know, or, or why not send a Kenyan police force to Ukraine, you know, to help. Right. And so, so part of that to me is the, the, it's telling. And I want to quickly just say briefly. Oh, well, the, the reason you won't send those black Kenyan forces to Ukraine is because the Nazis, the racist Nazis in Ukraine would chop off their heads. That's why. Well, well, the, well, well, definitely, but, but this <laughs> idea that it's easier to watch one black group kill another. Oh, right? no, 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 no. I, I truly understand the basis yeah. of the question. No, I know. I just... <laughs> no. Yes, yes, we know, we know. It's it's just really, <clears throat> it's really distressing um, to, 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 to think about that because look at what's happening right now um, in the occupied territories where you have um, the Zionist state destroying, killing right now, as we know, what, more than 7,000 people, 3,000 children. And we have an internal so-called gang problem, but we're getting a chapter seven military deployment to invade Haiti. But the Zionist state, the Zionist entity can get away with killing how many people? And nobody's thinking about sending a military force to stop this bombing, right? So just think about- No, the the military force that's being sent is is facilitating the bombing is to facilitate it and so why so i i want people to make those connections because it's just you have to think well why isn't it absurd to send an armed military force to deal with gangs so-called gangs in haiti but you're not doing it for jamaica which has been under a state of emergency for two years over gangs you're not doing it in the middle east right (laughs) and so we have to think about well this makes no sense this idea of a military invasion of haiti makes no sense in light of what's going on in the in light of ukraine and in light of what's going on in the occupied territories. You mentioned China a, a little bit earlier. And I, I always say to folks, when you when you engage in these type, type of conversations, it's, it's usually a good idea to have a map in front of you so that you can understand the geopolitics. So we know that China has been establishing relationships with Nicaragua. We know that China is establishing relationships with Guatemala, and those are in those are in Central America. And we know that there's been discussions about China building a canal to rival the Panama Canal through Nicaragua. And we know that the United States does not want that to happen. So, and we also know that the United States has been anxious to build a naval base in Haiti. So connect, if you could connect those dots. Am am I wrong to connect? Again, the show is connecting the dots. Am I wrong to connect those dots? No, you're not wrong at all. I, I, you know, the Global Fragilities Act specifically names China and Russia. So let's get that clear, right? And so the other, the one of the things is the waning power of the empire, right? Because they know that what their military used to be able to do, they can't do anymore. Look, they got, you know, they got beat by the Taliban. 20 years later, how many trillions of dollars? Um, they destroyed Iraq. They, they, when was the last time the U.S. won a war? Right? I mean, let's be real, except maybe, World War II. you know, <laughs> right. And even oh, that, Grenade, they Panama. had a lot of help from the Red Army. Let's be real. And Panama. <laughs> Right, Panama. Right, I mean, or a you know, big, they, huge they, military power called Panama. Right, and Grenada. Right, we just celebrated the 40th anniversary of the invasion of Grenada. Or you know, you land in Haiti and you re, you know you send your, your special forces and you remove your the, the sitting president. Right, 
but it's so they know that they're losing militarily. They know that they could they cannot sustain the multiple fronts. But they also know the rise of China and Russia is inevitable, right? Not even they're already there, right? And so they mm -hmm. know that they can't compete. And so they have to figure out how to mitigate that. And I do think I, I so that connection is good. You know, you do you know that Haiti is only one of eleven countries that recognizes Taiwan, mm -hmm. right? So what does that tell you, right? And they were forced, you know, they were forced to recognize Taiwan. And, you know, I think, I don't remember if it was under Duvalier who was a staunch anti-communist and really Wait terrorized. Who forced, who forced Haiti to recognize Taiwan? It was the U.S. government. To, right, oh, that, to, but wait a bit, Dr. Pierre. Right. That can't be because we have a one China policy. Right. So how could that be? No, it's just really fascinating. You know, the more I think about it, the more I come to know this history. And you realize, well, why is Haiti only one of 11 countries to recognize Taiwan? And why was Taiwan coming to Haiti to sign, you know, bilateral, um, you know, um, uh, deals and so on and so forth? And so, so part of that is they've been able to keep Haiti as one of the few in the region, as one of the few people to recognize Taiwan as opposed to China, even though the U.S. itself, as you say, has a one China policy. So I do think this is all connected. I think the U.S. is trying to entrench itself it wants to be near haiti closer to haiti because it's worried about venezuela it's it's still mad about cuba um it's worried about this you're right this canal that nicaragua wants to get with the help of china and it it war with china is inevitable you know they all know that because they know that that's the only way they can try to hold on to 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 this flailing empire and so they're gonna need to do as much as they can but because they don't have the strength from military numbers to the capacity, you know, you have 800 bases, that's a vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they're going to get other, you have, you know, look what's happening right now in the Middle East, your bases are being attacked, they're sitting ducks, right? And so if you have all of these things there, if you can talk some people still into doing the dirty work for you, which is why they have military exercises with the Caribbean, Operation Trade Winds, they have military exercises with West Africa, right? And so they want to use these as proxies, the way that they use Ukraine as a proxy against Russia. So they're going to use these as proxies against China. And that's the connection, right? The connection is all about trying to maintain <clears throat> global dominance, but not having enough firepower, not having the political power to do so. So then using these others while you still can to do the dirty work for you. Talk, if you would, please, about the Dominican Republic, the Dominican Republic's role uh, as it relates to Haiti and Colombia as well, because uh, I think it, that I that I read a number of reports that the assat that some of the assassins that went in to Haiti and assassinated President Moise were Colombia or were out of Colombia, and we know that Colombia is one of the training bases for the CIA uh, as the CIA uh, projects its power in Central and South America. Yeah, uh, well, Colombia, <clears throat> yeah, so, the, you know, Colombia also, you know, outsources mercenaries. And so it's right. very easy um, to use, you know. Trained 20, by the United States. Right. 23 out of the 26 mercenaries um, come out of Colombia. Colombia is interesting. And, you know, I, I'm not a Colombia expert. What's interesting is the fact that they elected this leftist president, but Colombia has a long history of right wing um, 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 uh, 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 governments also with fealty to to the U.S. And so we have to ask Colombia, well, why are there still U.S. military bases in Colombia, right? So why did they sign an agreement um, to be with NATO, right? To be like a NATO ally, NATO ally. And so Colombia is definitely part of that. I think, um, uh, I, forgot your, <laughs> I forgot your question, no, but I, I- I was asking about the, the, the relationship between the Dominican Republic and Colombia oh, okay. as it relates to uh, being uh, proxies, basically, for the United States. Well, definitely, and I and I don't know. I know the relationship of the Dominican Republic with Haiti. Um, and one of the things, like you know, you know, Haiti during the Haitian Revolution took took over the entire island to re, to get rid of the Spanish and to end slavery. And it's a very complicated history. And so, in, after Haitians beat the um, the French. Um, they um, they had to take over the entire island in order to stop the constant attacks that were coming around. But also they got rid of slavery. And so then um, the, the Spanish helped, you know, the elites get 
back that part of the island. And the, the relationship has always been fraught. You know, the Dominican Republic has a deep anti-Haitianism, which is very much deep in racism and anti-Blackness. And so then that you have is, you know, our, our, our legacy with the Dominican Republic is a 1937 massacre, um, um, Parsley massacre, where they chopped down um, about, you know, 30,000 Haitians and dumped them in the river, which is why that river, um, if you heard that in the news, is called Massacre River, is the Dominican Republic massacring Haitians. Um, they've always, um, you know, with the, the 2004 coup d'etat, a lot of the paramilitaries were trained in the military in, in the Dominican Republic. A lot of the arms are, are, are going into from the Dominican Republic. And this, this Abinazer, Abinader, who's one of the most racist right wing um, presidents the Dominican Republic has had, has been going after Haitians forever. So, for example, in 2013, the Dominican Republic denationalized 240,000 people, Dominicans of Haitian descent, going back eight generations, right? So these people were Dominicans and basically removed citizenship from them. And Abinader has been rounding up the Haitian workers that have been in the Dominican Republic um, for generations, right? Cutting cane and so on and so forth. And that itself is a result of you know, policies in the region that impoverish people and force them to go out and, and provide cheap labor. So the Dominican Republic and Haiti have had a really acrimonious um, history and but then the U.S. Border Patrol is helping the Dominican Republic build a wall, right, to separate Haiti and the DR. So the U.S.'s hand is always in there. And we always have to, you know, it, and it's not to take away agency from the Dominicans or from the Haitians. But the truth is, the reason that Haiti becomes significant is because they're one of the few places that still fight back. And I don't think people realize it. And that's one thing you have to think about Haiti. It's not that it's a mess. The reason they're still going after it is because it's, it's still fighting back. Places like Jamaica, for example, you know, I don't know if people saw, there's a report recently that Jamaicans have no, regular Jamaicans no longer have access to their beaches. They have all been privatized and owned by foreigners. And so they're, what they've become is a captive labor force to provide labor for these, you know, these resorts. Well, Haiti, we don't have that yet. I mean, we have it in the northern part where, you know, um, in La Badie, which is, you know, which the Duvalier sold to, I think, Royal Caribbean Cruises. But this is what they want for Haiti. They want to remove the people from the land where people still own a lot of their land, where the country is still predominantly agricultural. They want to remove them from the land, privatize everything, steal the land, and turn it into a captive labor force for, um, for, for, for capital. Uh, and so... I, wait a minute. To that point, I, I read and I that the Clintons have purchased an inordinate amount of land in Haiti to build a private resort, basically to model what's been done in Jamaica. Jamaica, definitely. Jamaica, Barbados, all those places. The other thing, the Clintons are, you know, the other thing we have to talk about, the mineral wealth in Haiti. You oh, know, wait a minute. When... And, one, one, and one, more, one more point real quick is that you talked about resistance. I believe when those when those Kenyan if those Kenyan forces make land in on Haiti, they won't they know got, what's coming. They got a fight on their <laughs> hands that they yeah. won't be prepared to manage. Yeah, I, I don't think they it's going to be as easy as they think. And and um, oh, you wanted to hit on the mineral. On the mineral, right? And people also don't remember, you know, don't know. That Haiti, you know, if you you can look this up, there are all these reports that Haiti has billions and billions of dollars worth of minerals, and that people want. In fact, you know, one of the you know when they decided to to start like mining for gold, the first person that got a a, a mining permit was Hillary Clinton's brother. You brother can look out of Canada, <laughs> right? <laughs> Right. And so we have to think about Canada, too, because Canada is, you know, people call think of Canada as like little brother imperialism. But Canada has been front and center. In fact, Canada still has big manufacturing hubs. Gildan still produces T-shirts and stuff like that in Haiti. So it's, it's just it's just really interesting to think about how I want to I wanted to end by saying this is not a victimization. I think people like to say, oh, poor Haitians. Oh, look at this. Look at this. These people suffer so much they can't get a break. And I'm like, well, the truth is they've been fighting back, which is why they can't get a break. And they're going to continue to fight back. And so you can't only see them as perpetual victims. What you need to see is do analysis and connect the ways that all the different um, the ways that empire has tried to keep the people down, despite the fact that they're standing up to fight back. You've got a hard stop. I greatly appreciate you giving me the time today. 
you talked about minerals. There are geological reports that show there may be more more oil, oil. off the coast of Haiti than there is in Venezuela. Venezuela. And Venezuela has the largest reserve of oil in the yes. world. Yes. Um, Dr. Jamima Pierre, how can people find you, connect with you if they need to? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, you can find me on YouTube through all these various uh, uh, interviews and, and my publications um, all over. Just a basic Black Google Agenda Report. And Black Agenda Report, as well as the Black Alliance for Peace. We Dr. have a whole Haiti resource page. Dr. Jamima Pierre, thank you so much for your time. Really, really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Folks, I got to thank my guest, Dr. Jamima Pierre, for joining me today. And thank you all so much for listening to the Connecting the Dots podcast with me, Dr. Wilmer Leon. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. Also, please follow and subscribe, leave a review, and please, 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 baby, please, baby, baby, please share my show. Follow us on social media. You can find all the links below in the show description. Remember, this is where analysis, the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge because talk without analysis is just chatter, and we don't chatter on Connecting the Dots. See you again next time. Until then, I'm Dr. Wilmer Leon. Have a great one. Peace and blessings. I'm out. Connecting the Dots with Dr. Wilmer Leon, where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge.